welcome back. We are going to go through our final session for today. Uh, and then tomorrow, of course, we have a little lighter schedule. Tomorrow we have only two sessions in the morning and two sessions in the afternoon. But we're going to begin on page 51. And the title is Sighing and Crying in Jerusalem. And it's related to what we just studied about uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. But now we're going to look at some additional aspects. Once again, this is related to the prophecy of Habakkuk. All of this is background to what's taking place in the book of Habakkuk. So let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll delve right into our study. Father in heaven, as we begin this session, we ask for the presence of your spirit. We thank you for your holy word, which uh, gives us such valuable information in a world that appears to be so confused. I ask that you will be with us and teach us from your word, and empower us to live by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go to Revelation chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. This is describing the second coming of Christ. And uh, I want you to notice here the reaction of the wicked, of the lost. It says there in Revelation 6, 14, Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up. And every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? So the question is, is everyone going to be hiding in the caves and pleading for the rocks to fall upon them? The question is, who in this terrible calamity will be able to stand? The very next chapter has the answer. Those who are sealed with the seal of God. Let's read Revelation 7, 1 to 3. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees. In other words, don't bring about this calamity that we read immediately before in this, in this co context. It says, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So what is described in verses 14 to 17 of chapter 6 is not going to come until the sealing takes place. And the purpose of the sealing is to protect the sealed from the calamities that are going to befall the earth in the previous chapter. Now, the guiding principle that we need to apply in studying this story from Ezekiel is found in a comparison between Revelation 7, 1 through 4, and Ezekiel chapter 8 and 9. So in other words, in order to understand the sealing in Revelation 7, verses 1 through 4, we need to understand it in the light of a story that we find in the Old Testament, in Ezekiel 8 and 9. Ezekiel 9 describes the type that was fulfilled with the literal Jews in literal Jerusalem, in the literal land of Israel. However, the fulfillment of this in Revelation is not with the literal Jews in the literal land of Israel. It is with spiritual Jews in the entire world. The type is limited. The anti-type 
is global and spiritual. That's the principle that we need to apply as we look at the typology between the Old Testament story and the book of Revelation. The Ezekiel type describes God's own professed people in the Middle East who were in apostasy. However, the book of Revelation anti-type describes the Christian world that claims to serve God but is also in apostasy. Now, who was to blame for the apostasy among God's people in the book of Ezekiel with literal Jerusalem, literal Israel, with the literal Jews who profess to serve the Lord? The main guilt was with the religious leaders because they misguided the people. Notice Jeremiah 5 and verse 31. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. And now notice the people are also guilty, because it says, And my people love to have it so. But what will you do in the end? People these days trust their religious leaders blindly, what they say from the pulpit. Because they say, this is a spiritual leader. This person has to have it right. No doubt about it. But the people in the days of Ezekiel were in apostasy because of what was being done by the prophets and by the priests that were the spiritual leaders of Israel. Ezekiel 22 verse 26 picks up on this. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things. They have not distinguished between the holy and the unholy. That means the holy and the common. Nor have they made known the difference between the clean, unclean and the clean. And they have hidden their eyes from my Sabbaths so that I am profaned among them. What a picture. The religious leaders were profaning the Sabbath. They were not teaching the people to distinguish between that which was holy and that which was common. They were violating the law of God and they were profaning that which was holy. That was the condition of the people in the days of Ezekiel. So now let's summarize chapter 1 of Ezekiel going through all the way through chapter 12 of this book. This is happening in the year 592 B.C. Most of these chapters, we're going to summarize the content because we can't read all of the material. I would, I would encourage you to read the passages that we find in Ezekiel 1 through Ezekiel 12. In chapter 1, as we saw in our previous study, a chariot comes from the north. That is where? Heaven. Where is the chariot moving to? It is moving to the Jerusalem temple. What is it moving there for? To perform a work of investigative judgment. To separate between the sealed and those who do not have the seal before destruction comes upon Israel. This throne is surrounded by cherubim, like we studied in our previous presentation. That's chapter 1. Now chapters 2 through 6 describe the spiritual condition of those who profess to serve God. All kinds of abominations are mentioned in these chapters that tell us how the people were living in apostasy, those who claimed to serve God. Chapter 7, therefore, tells us that because of the apostasy that is described in chapters 2 through 6, God is going to bring about destruction upon Jerusalem and upon his apostate people. Let's read chapter 7 and verses 1 through verse 4. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, and you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end, the end has come upon the four corners of the land. 
Do we have the idea of four corners in Revelation 7? Four angels at the four corners? God is going to say the winds are going to be released. Now destruction is going to come from the four corners. Verse 3, now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your what? A key word, all your abominations. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity, but I will repay your ways, and once again, and your abominations will be in your midst, then you shall know that I am the Lord. Destruction is coming for the, from the four corners of the land, is what God is saying. Of course, this is speaking about the land where Israel lived. It's local with the literal Jews. Revelation is going to pick up on this, and it's going to apply it to the global Christian world, and spiritual Israel, those who are children of Abraham, because they have embraced truly Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then we come to chapter 8. God promised the destruction of the city because of the abominations that were being committed in Jerusalem. Chapter 8 provides a list of the abominations that were being committed. And it presents this list in escalating severity. God shows Ezekiel an abomination that's being committed in the city, and Ezekiel says, wow, Lord, that's terrible. The Lord says, you haven't seen anything yet. There are greater abominations than these. And so, throughout the chapter, you have a list of abominations culminating in the greatest abomination. And we're going to see that in a moment. What is the word abomination? What does the word abomination mean? Well, let's notice just one verse where we find the meaning of abomination, what the people were doing in the city. Deuteronomy 7, 25 and 26. God is instructing Israel as they're about to enter the promised land. You shall burn the carved images of their gods with fire. You shall not covet the silver or gold that is on them, that is the idols, nor take it for yourselves, lest you be snared by it, for it is on what? An abomination. So what is the abomination? It is worshiping idols. Verse 26, nor shall you bring an abomination into your house. Speaking about idols. Lest you be doomed to destruction like it, you shall utterly detest it and utterly abhor it, for it is an accursed thing. So what is abomination relating to? It is relating to idolatry. Now what was the greatest abomination that was being committed by those who professed to serve God? At the top of the list of abominations being committed by those who professed to serve the Lord was that the religious leaders were worshiping the sun God. God promised that this abomination would lead to desolation. There you have the expression, abomination of desolation. The abomination leads to desolation or to destruction. So to speak, sun worship was the straw that broke the camel's back. It was the drop that filled the cup. Let's read about this terrible abomination, the greatest of all, worshiping the sun. Ezekiel 8, verses 16 through 18. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple of the Lord, this happening in the very, in the very church of the day, between the porch and the altar, about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord. What are they doing when they're worshiping the sun? They are turning their backs on the Lord. So once again, there were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east, and they were worshiping the sun toward the east. And so God says, because of this great sin, along with all of the other abominations, the idolatry, I am going to destroy the city. Ezekiel 8, 17 and 18. In other words, the abomination will lead to desolation. 
It says in Ezekiel 8, 17 and 18, And he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Therefore, I also will act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. Why were they worshiping idols? Because they had forgotten their Creator. Correct? They forgot the Creator. What relationship is there between creation and worship? Let's go to a statement, first of all, from Ellen White in The Great Controversy, page 438, and then we're going to read from Psalm 95. Ellen White wrote, Had the Sabbath been universally kept, man's thoughts and affections would have been led to the Creator as the object of reverence and worship, and there would never have been an idolater, an atheist, or an infidel. Because as people kept the Sabbath, they would be remembering that there's only one Creator, the true God. Every week they would be remembering that. She continues, the keeping of the Sabbath is a sign of loyalty to the true God. Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. It follows that the message which commands men to worship God and keep his commandments will especially call upon them to keep which commandment? The fourth commandment, which is the sign of the creator. What sign did God establish at creation to remind Adam and Eve that he was the creator? The Sabbath. The Sabbath in Exodus 31 is called the sign between God and Israel. It was the reminder, the weekly reminder that God was the creator. If they had always kept the Sabbath, they would not have worshipped other gods, especially the sun god. Now notice the relationship between creation and worship. Let me ask you, why do we worship the creator? Why do creatures worship the creator? Well, because he is just that. He's the creator, right? Now let's notice Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For, that means because, the Lord is the great God and the great King above all gods. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. Is this referring to the creator, yes or no? Yeah, it says, the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hand, hands form the dry land. And now what should be the response? Because God is the creator and he owns everything. It continues saying, O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. Why do we kneel before the Lord our Maker? Because He's our Creator. And He deserves our worship. Correct? And what is the sign that He gave that He is the Creator? The Holy Sabbath. Now, Ezekiel chapter 20 repeatedly describes Sabbath desecration by the literal Jewish nation. Let's read, this is a very extensive passage, but I'm going to read the entire passage because of the importance of the Sabbath that is mentioned in this passage. It says there in verse 12, Moreover, I also gave them the Jewish Sabbath, uh, okay, you're still awake out there? I also gave them my Sabbaths. You know why it's his Sabbath? Because he was in the one that rested first. It's his Sabbath before it's ours. 
I gave them a Sabbath to be what? Ah, a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. In other words, that sets them apart. Yet how did Israel react? Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. And they greatly defiled, here's the first reference, they defiled what? My Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the Lord. Why was God going to pour out his fury upon them? Because they defiled his Sabbaths. So once again, then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them. But I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey the glory of all lands. Because they despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, and here it is again, second time, but profaned my Sabbaths. And what was the result of profaning the Sabbath? For their heart went after their what? Idols. Would that have happened if they had kept the Sabbath? Of course not. How could they worship an idol giving that creative power if they kept the Sabbath with points that there's only one true creator? 17. Nevertheless, my eye spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. But I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with, here's it again, with their what? With their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them. Hallow, here it is again, what? My Sabbaths, and they will be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am the Lord your God. When we keep the Sabbath, we are recognizing that we are God's separated people, dedicated people, and that God is our God, that the Creator is our God. So Israel's history was one of constant desecration of the Sabbath which would have reminded them of the Creator and made it impossible for them to worship idols, particularly the sun. But not everybody in the city of Jerusalem was practicing false worship and the abominations. So when destruction came, it would not be fair to destroy them along with everyone else. And so God says we are going to separate a group by placing a seal on them. And when the destruction comes, they will be protected from the destruction. Ezekiel 9, verses 1 through 4. Then he called out in my hearing with a loud voice saying, Let those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. See, destruction is coming. And suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle axe in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen. Who is this? The high priest was clothed in linen. One man among them, and by the way, this is a description of the Day of Atonement, because it's separating the righteous from the unrighteous, which happened on the Day of Atonement. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a writer's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the bronze altar. Now the glory of the Lord of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. And he, that is the Lord, called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, Go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads. Does this have any relationship with uh, chapter 7 of the book of Revelation? Putting a mark on the forehead? Absolutely. Put a mark on the foreheads of the men, now here's the characteristic, who sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done within it. So there was a group that was sighing and crying because of all of the false worship that was going on, particularly the worship of the sun god. The man clothed in linen appears to be Jesus Christ. At this point, we know 
why God came to Jerusalem chapter 1. Right? Came to Jerusalem chapter 1. What did he come for? He came to perform a work of judgment. To separate the righteous from the unrighteous before the destruction of the city. The description is that the work of the high priest in the most holy place on the day of atonement. When Israel was divided into two groups. Those who sighed and cried and those who were practicing the abominations in the city. By the way, the man who is clothed in linen, according to Leviticus 16 verse 4, would be a reference to Christ. Because speaking about the high priest, it says, he shall put on the holy linen tunic. This is on the day of atonement. And the linen trousers on his body, he shall be girded with li a linen sash, and with a linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. So this is describing the day of atonement. The separation of the righteous from the unrighteous. The sealing of those who sigh and cry so that when destruction comes, they are protected. Are you starting to catch an interesting picture here? Now after separating the righteous from the unrighteous, destruction would come upon those who were not sealed. Notice Ezekiel 9 verses 5 through 7. To the others he said in my hearing, Go after him through the city and kill. In other words, after the sealing. Do not let your eyes spare, nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women. But do not come near anyone on whom is the mark. And begin where? At my sanctuary. Why at the sanctuary? Who was guilty of the apostasy according to what we notice? The religious leaders. So they are much more responsible than the people whom they deceived. And so it says, So they began with the elders who were before the temple. Then he said to them, Defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. And now we need to notice, go back a little bit and see that something happened before the destruction came. I just wanted you to see that there's a ceiling, and after the ceiling comes the destruction. But now we need to go back to uh, chapter 10, or forward to chapter 10. After the work of the ceiling was complete, the most holy place, Shekinah, you know what the Shekinah is, right? The glory that was in the most holy place, representing the presence of God, it departed from the sanctuary. And national apostasy led to national ruin. Does that sound familiar? The abomination that leads to desolation, if you please. The man clothed in linen then did what? After the sealing took place, he poured out the coals of the censer upon the city and it was consumed. This is referring to the high priest who waved the incense before the Lord, which represents the prayers of God's people, the prayers of the saints. But now the censer is thrown down, which means that the censer is no longer interceding. This is the close of probation. The Shekinah glory, the presence of God, is about to depart from the city. And when it departs from the city, the city has no defense against Nebuchadnezzar and his armies that come to destroy those who did not sigh and cry because of the abominations. And so in Ezekiel chapter 10 verses 1 and 2, we find these words, And I looked, and there in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance of the likeness of a throne. Then he, the one seated on the throne, spoke to the man clothed with linen, who is whom? Jesus, and said, Go in among the wheels, under the cherub, fill your hands with coals of fire from among the cherubim, and scatter them over the city. And he went in as I watched. What is going to happen now with the fire that used to intercede? It is going to consume the city. The coals that interceded no longer intercede. The coals 
are now cast on the city and the city is going to burn because intercession has come to an end. But the Shekinah did not leave just instantly. Notice Ezekiel 11, 22 and 23. The Shekinah glory left the, te the temple of Jerusalem and it lingered on the Mount of Olives. I wish I had time to go into the abomination of desolation as it was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem for the second time. But you can find that in the Matthew 24 series. My favorite study notes of all time. Matthew chapter 24 and the series because it's a different way of understanding Bible prophecy. In chronological order you have all of the events as they will occur in a straight line. That's not true of Daniel. Daniel has repetitive cycles. It flashbacks and then goes forward. Revelation is even more complicated. It goes backwards, forwards, it goes in cycles, and unless you know how to decode the book, you're, you're not going to know where you're at. But Matthew is simple because everything is in strict chronological order. So in Ezekiel eleven twenty two 22 and 23, by the way, Jesus, after he said, your house is left unto you desolate, he went and he sat on the Mount of Olives and gave Matthew 24. So the cherubim lifted up their wings with the wheels beside them, and the glory of the God of Israel was high above them. And the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city. So let me ask you, is the Shekinah going to abandon the city now? The protection of the city is leaving. It says, and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city, and what did it do? It stood on the mountain, which is on the east side of the city. What is the mountain east of the city? It is the Mount of Olives. And what followed? The departure of the Shekinah from the city. 2 Chronicles 36, 17 to 19 is going to speak about the destruction of the city by fire. It says there, Therefore he brought against them the king of the Chaldeans, who killed their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and no compassion on young man or virgin, or the aged or the weak. He gave them all into his hand, and all the articles from the house of God, great and small, the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his leaders, all these he took to Babylon. Then they burned the house of God, broke down the wall of Jerusalem, burned all its palaces with fire, and destroyed all of its precious possessions. The abomination that led to desolation. Because of the apostasy and idolatry in the city, the greatest abomination being the worship of the sun by the leadership. Now, some people might say, well, Pastor Boer, are you saying that the city was destroyed because people didn't keep the Sabbath? That's exactly what I'm saying. And that's exactly what the Bible says. Let's notice Nehemiah, Jeremiah chapter 17 and verses 21 to 27. Jeremiah 17 and verses 21 through verse 27. Thus says the Lord. By the way, Jeremiah was the prophet just before the captivity. Okay? During the reign of King Josiah. Thus says the Lord, take heed to yourselves and bear no burden. When? On the Sabbath day. Nor bring it in by the gates of Jerusalem. Nor carry a burden out of your houses. When? on the Sabbath day, nor do any work, but hallow, excuse me, the Sabbath day, as I commanded to your fathers. But they did not obey, nor incline their ear, but made their necks stiff, that they might not hear, nor receive instruction. And it shall be, if you heed me carefully, says the Lord, to bring no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work in it. What would happen if they were observing the Sabbath? Then shall enter the gates of this city kings and princes sitting on the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses, they and their princes accompanied by the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and this city shall remain forever. 
What would happen if they were observing the Sabbath and respecting the Creator and not worshiping the Son? The city would remain forever. It would not be destroyed. But what happened if they didn't keep the Sabbath? Let's continue reading. It continues in verse 26. And they shall come from the cities of Judah and from the places around Jerusalem, from the land of Benjamin, and from the lowland, from the mountains, and from the south, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings and incense, bringing sacrifices of praise to the house of the Lord. Wow! The city was going to be tremendously blessed. But now notice. But if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kill, kindle fire in its gates, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. Did the destruction of the city have anything to do with the profanation of the Sabbath? Absolutely. The city would have remained forever if they'd kept the Sabbath, because in keeping the Sabbath, they would be confessing their Belief in the Creator. They would be worshiping the Creator. It was the sign between God and Israel. It was a sign that He was their God. In other words, it was more than a day. It was the evidence that they served the Lord. But if they trampled on the Sabbath and they worshiped idols and they worshiped the sun, that means that they forgot the Sabbath. Are you following me or not? Now, Let's apply this to the end time. Is Sunday worship idolatry? Is it the same to worship the sun as it is to worship on the day of the sun? Some people say, no, there's no, there's no similarity. Yes, there is. Let's ask three questions. Who created the sun? God. Was it created for worship? No. It was created as a secular object, not for worship. So what happens if you make the sun an object of worship? What is that called? Idolatry. Now let's ask three additional questions. Who created the first day of the week? The day of the sun. Who created it? God, uh, God did. Did he create the first day for worship? No. It's a common day of work. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. So what happens if you make Sunday a day of worship? It's idolatry. It doesn't matter if it's an object or if it's a day. Anything that man makes for worship that God did not make for worship is idolatry. Now, let's take two stories from the Bible that show how serious this is. You've heard of Belshazzar. Some call him Belshazzar. I call him Belshazzar. Anyway, on the final night before the fall of Babylon, he was celebrating a banquet with a thousand of his luminaries and dignitaries. And he did something very serious. He called for the holy vessels of the sanctuary to be brought to use them for the secular purpose of drinking wine in them. Let's read chapter 5 of Daniel, verses 1 through 4. Belshazzar, the king of what nation? Babylon, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords. And what did he do? He drank wine in the presence of the thousand. Now listen to carefully. While he tasted the wine, did the wine have anything to do with him not distinguishing the holy from the common? Yeah, because it says, while he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Using holy vessels, for a common pur purpose. It continues saying, verse 3, Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines, drank wine from them. 
Is wine playing a very important uh, point here, very important, important uh, uh, aspect of this story? Absolutely. They drank wine. And now notice, because they drank wine, they fell into idolatry. Correct? And so it says, they drank wine, and what was the result? They praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. In other words, drinking wine led to idolatry and not being able to distinguish between that which was holy and that which was common. In other words, Belshazzar's sin was that he took something that was holy and he treated it as if it was common. But now we have a different story. But before we get to that different story, let's read what happened to Belshazzar. Chapter 5 and verses 22 through 24. There's a handwriting on the wall. And the wise men of Babylon cannot interpret the meaning of the handwriting on the wall. So eventually Daniel comes before Belshazzar. And somebody might say, well, Belshazzar didn't know that those were holy vessels. Hmm, didn't know? Let's read. This is Daniel speaking to Belshazzar. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, because he just told him the story of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity, where he became a vegetarian for seven years, because it says he ate the grass of the field. And by the way, it worked, because it clarified his mind. <laughs> I'm not really making a point of that. But anyway, verse 23, And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven, they have brought the vessels of his house before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines, have drunk wine from them. You have praised the gods, here's the idolatry, you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, and the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. What was it that not, didn't allow him to distinguish the holy from the common? He was drunk with wine. Does wine play a role in the book of Revelation? It does. Not only in Revelation, in Habakkuk. Don't think that we're just filling in with this. You say, when are we going to get to Habakkuk? Well, when we, when we have the background, then we're going to understand Habakkuk a lot better. We have a different story. You see, Belshazzar's sin was that he took what was holy and he treated it like it was common. But we have another story where the sons of Aaron took that which was common and they presented it as if it was holy. God had instructed that fire needed to be taken from the altar of sacrifice because he rained that fire from heaven that was holy fire. And yet Nadab and Abihu took strange fire before the Lord. A common fire, maybe from, from where they were cooking, or who knows where. I don't think they had matches back then. But it was a common fire, not a fire, not the holy fire that God had rained from heaven. Now let me ask you, if you looked at that fire, um, would it look just like, uh, just like ordinary fire? Sure. If you put your finger in that fire, would it burn your finger just like any other kind of fire? Absolutely. If you study the chemical properties of both fires, would they be alike? Yes. What made the fire that God rained on the altar holy fire? The facts that God had made it holy. Common fire might look like it, but it wasn't holy. And so, in verses 8 through 10 of Leviticus 10, we find 8 through 11 through Leviticus 10, then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Why, why did these young men offer, the, offer a common fire as if it was holy? Ah, here's the secret. Then the Lord spoke to Aaron, saying, Do not drink wine or intoxicating drink. You nor your sons with you when you go into the tabernacle of meeting, lest you die. In what condition were Nabed and Abihu? 
they were drunk. And then it continues, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that you may, now notice, what is the re reason for not drinking wine? That you may distinguish between the holy and the unholy, that is the common, and between clean and unclean, and then something else. And that you may teach the children of Israel all the statutes which the Lord has spoken to them by the hand of Moses. Ellen White wrote this, Among professed Christians there are idolaters, men and women who are not sealed by God. Many have subverted the Christian faith into idolatry, giving to a man-made institution the glory and honor that God requires for His Sabbath day and compelling others to worship this idol. Such ones will surely be visited with God's retributive judgments, which are to be poured out without mixture of mercy upon the unrepentant despisers of God's law. Are you catching the picture? Now there are many Christians who are idolaters. They don't know they're idolaters by observing the day of the sun, which is a man-made institution for worship. If it's a man-made institution, would it be idolatry to keep a man-made institution as if it were holy? Of course. You know what human beings have done? They've taken a common day of work and they've made it holy. And they've taken the holy day and they've made it common. If God accepts that, he's going to have to apologize to Belshazzar and Nadab and Abihu. Because the principle is the same. Now, let's talk a little bit about memorials. It is common knowledge that historical memorials must be observed on the same day when the original event occurred, correct? For example, what day do we celebrate the, end of the Declaration of Independence of the United States? July 4. Why do we do it July 4? Why don't we do it on August 4? It's a day. It's a month. So why not August 4th? Because that's not when the original event occurred. To commemorate it, you have to commemorate it on the same day on which the original event occurred. What day do they read the 3,000 names at the World Trade Center? On the 11th of September. Well, isn't October 11 just as good? No, why not? Because that is not when the original event took place. You see, you can only celebrate an original event on the day in which it occurred. My wife and I were married on December 23. We've been married for 52 years almost. It's a long time, patient woman. Actually, if you talk to her, I can give you her phone number. She'll say pretty nice things about me. <laughs> anyway, we celebrate our anniversary on December 23. Why do you think we celebrate our anniversary December 23? Because that's the day we got married. How do you think my wife would think if I said, you know, we've been doing this for 52 years, same day, same day, same day. Let's celebrate our anniversary this year on my birthday, June 26. What would she say? Have you been drinking the Kool-Aid? <laughs> she wouldn't say that because she knows that I don't drink. But my point is that you have to celebrate an original event on the same day on which it occurred. Do you know that Pope John Paul II and Benedict XVI, as well as Francis I, have said that we need to keep Sunday in honor of the Creator. That is not possible. Because God did not rest on Sunday from creation, He rested on the Sabbath. You have to rest on the same day that God rested to commemorate it. So to say, oh, my Sabbath is Sunday, I say, right, it's your Sabbath. But it's not the Lord's Sabbath. Are you following me? 
Now Revelation 17 has the final fulfillment of this. The final and global fulfillment of the Ezekiel type. This chapter describes a harlot who is committing fornication with the kings of the earth. God promises to make her desolate. She is identified as Babylon and gives fermented wine to all the inhabitants of the planet. As a result, they cannot distinguish between holy and common, and they fall into idolatry. In Bible prophecy, we know that the harlot woman represents an apostate church. This is a church that claims to love and serve Christ, yet tramples upon the Sabbath and exalts the idolatrous Sunday. The harlot represents an apostate church. She is a global church because she sits on nations, multitudes, tongues, and peoples. She mingles religion with politics because we are told that she fornicates with the kings of the earth. She has daughters that were born from her at certain point later on in her career because she's the mother of harlots. She gives her abominable wine. This is going to be our next study, first session tomorrow morning. She gives abominable wine. By the way, not Ernest and Julio Gallo. Not wine, literal wine, because at the end, Babylon represents a spiritual system, a global system. The wine is a symbol. The fornication is not going to bed literally. It's fornication, spiritual fornication. And at the end, it's global. She gives her abominable wine a false doctrine to the world, which makes it impossible for them to distinguish between holy and secular day of worship. And as a result, they fall into idolatry. She has a history of shedding the blood of God's faithful people. And she claims to have changed God's law. The little horn thought it could change God's law. Now, let's go to our last section because time is flying by a matter of authority. The final controversy will not be over a matter of days, primarily. Behind the day is the issue of authority. When we keep the Sabbath, it is a sign that we are obedient to the Creator, and when we keep Sunday, it is a sign that we are obedient to the power who claims to have changed the day. It's the same controversy that existed in the Garden of Eden. Only God used a different way of testing Adam and Eve. At the beginning, God tested with a tree. At the end, he tests with a day. What was the issue in the Garden of Eden? If Eve abstained from eating from the tree... She would be respecting the authority of whom? The authority of God. If she ate the fruit, she would be obeying the authority of whom? Of Satan. Behind the tree was the issue of which authority are you going to obey? Are you following me? That's in the Garden of Eden. At the end, it's going to be an issue of a day that is going to determine which side you are on. Whether you respect the authority of God by keeping the day he has established or the authority of Satan and the day that he has led to be adopted in the Christian world. Sadly, Protestantism was never able to sever her relationship with the mother church. The Protestants never totally forsook the mother because they brought with them many of her doctrines. Among her doctrines, the idea that the dead aren't dead, that the soul leaves the body at death, the immortality of the soul. She also adopted from the papacy the idea that hell will burn forever. And she embraced from the papacy the idea that Sunday is a day that we should honor God as the creator. And therefore, the Protestant churches will return to mother. Notice this last remarkable statement that we find by John O'Brien, who for decades taught at the University of Notre Dame near Andrews University. 
He challenges the Protestants, and at the end of the statement, he makes a very interesting remark. Let's read this statement. By the way, he was author of of over 40 books, very well known. He wrote, challenging Protestants, but since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church, observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Isn't that strange, he says? Yes, of course it is inconsistent, but this change was made about 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. And by that time, the custom was universally observed. And then uh, uh, he says to Protestants, They have continued the custom, even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. And now comes the key portion. That observance remains as a reminder of the Mother Church from which the non-Catholic sects broke away. Like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Are you catching the picture? Protestantism never severed its relationship with the mother, and therefore it will once again come back to mother. Did you understand this this study? How important is the Sabbath? It's a, matter, it's a matter of life and death. The Sabbath is the seal of God, the sign of God, that we worship the true God, that He is the only true God, that we owe Him our worship because He's the Creator. Every week we remember that. That's what the reason why, by the way, in the fourth commandment it says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Why would God say, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy? Because we might fall into what? Forgetting that the Sabbath is holy. And so God wants us to keep the Sabbath joyfully, not by force. He wants us to joyfully embrace the observance of the Sabbath, not because we have to, but because we love our Lord. We want to please Him and obey His authority.